In Nepal, he is recognized as a public intellectual, looked up to by the younger generation for his reformist credentials and accomplishments. His recently co-edited policy volume, The Great Upheaval, covering policy implications for Asia, resulting from the COVID-19 pandemic, was published by Cambridge University Press. Our guest today is Dr. Swarnim Wagle, who was the Chief Economic Advisor at the UNDP Regional Bureau for Asia and the Pacific in New York. He's a former Vice Chair and member of the National Planning Commission of Nepal, headed by the Prime Minister. Wagle also chairs a South Asian think tank, the Institute for Integrated Development Studies, based in Kathmandu, and is a member of the World Bank's tiered South Asia visioning and championing process. And that's where we met. He holds academic degrees from the London School of Economics, Harvard University, and the Australian National University. What a pleasure and an honor it is to have you in our studios today. It's a Dr. delight Wagner. to join you here, Rubana. Well, thank you so much for coming. You know, you wear different hats. You're also into politics and uh, uh, you're, a, you're a brilliant economist. But let me just start with one basic question on South Asia. How connected do you think we are really? And we all know the answer, but I just want your perspective. And uh, what do you think uh, BBIN is going to be and is it ever going to happen? So we know the story on SARC uh, and uh, South Asia. Uh, so the regional experiment has sort of stagnated. I, would, I don't want to call it a failure yet. It's mm. stagnated. Uh, not much has happened since the last summit uh, in Kathmandu in 2014, uh, of which I was part of. Even the uh, slogan I remember, I contributed to it. Um, but uh, the, there is some vibrancy on the bilateral front. So India, Bhutan, India, Nepal, India, Bangladesh, India, Sri Lanka, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, you know, the free trade agreement was quite active. So the, the puzzle for us, uh, Rubana, is, you know, do we see the regional project as amalgamation of all these bilateral things, or do we want a sub-regional project as a whole that is really greater than the sum of the parts, right? And this is where, you know, uh, some people think, oh, BBIN is there, you know, it will distract from the larger uh, South Asian project. But I'm actually uh, a proponent of it. I, I believe uh, there is some rationale to it in the sense that India is so big. And India's overwhelming presence uh, in South Asia, you know, distorts uh, a lot of these uh, other, other, other interactions. So if we focus on the Indian Northeast and maybe West Bengal, Bangladesh, and Bhutan, which is a bit of an exception, and then Nepal, if you just look at that corner of South Asia, I see some symmetry re uh, restored uh, to, 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 this, uh, to this idea. So uh, maybe there's something there. So symmetry. Um, and when the you know, economists talk about first best response and a second best response, so when you don't have the ideal you know, multilateral or regional uh, program going, it is okay to pursue sub-regionalism as a stepping stone to those larger goals as a second best recourse. And I also see this, uh, the Indian Northeast, this part of uh, you know, Bangladesh, Bhutan, Nepal, it's a gateway to Southeast Asia, which is uh, a more dynamic a more successful uh, region of our continent. So I think there are multiple arguments to push, uh, to push it forward. Um, but we need some quick success stories, maybe on energy uh, cooperation, on the land connectivity, even on air connectivity, rail connectivity, people-to-people -people movements, uh, and even branch it out a little bit uh, to maybe bring in climate change, because the shared ecology, right, the Himalayas that I come from, uh, the melting of the glaciers or the glacial lake outbursts affects lowland, uh, you know, regions like Bangladesh. And so we're tied in a, in a way. So if we can reimagine and frame BBI on, on these multiple fronts uh, and get it going, not as a project that distracts from SARC, but one that will eventually contribute uh, to that regional ambition. I think, uh, I think it's worth uh, pursuing. That's how I see it. I mean, uh, Swarnim, um, SARC hasn't really worked. So if BBIN works, even as a sub-regional plot, there's no harm. Absolutely, absolutely. And even on the, then it can be a model for, let's say, the southern part of India and Sri Lanka and Maldives can, can uh, go do a sub-regional grouping. The western part of India and Pakistan, the two Punjabs, maybe, you know, they will at least open up their borders and start trading, you know, lentils and cauliflowers rather than shipping things through Dubai. And so I... I you know, one uh, in living in South Asia, 
um, you know, one, one ha has to be uh, optimistic, I think. I kind of like that attitude. <laughs> it's just that there is a huge trust deficit in the entire region, and we've had historical baggages for years and yeah. for decades. I don't know how we'll get through any of them, but at least um, we are all progressing. Though the interregional trade is less than 5%, and it has been historically so for, again, decades, and we haven't really progressed much there, South Asian economy was beginning to look better. Mm. But just imagine, and very recently, uh, there has been a forecast that the South Asian growth will fall to 4.8% from the projected 5.6% in 2023. India, from a projected growth of 6.4, is going to come down to 5.8. Sri Lanka has already contracted around mm. 9%. And then it's supposed to be contracting for another 3.2% in 2023. And you know, Pakistan is not supposed to be growing beyond 2.5% mm -hmm. with all the natural calamities and, of course, other factors. So how is South Asia going to do? This is a temporary uh, phase, I think. Um, you know, the Russia-Ukraine war, obviously, the, you know, we're just getting out of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, but the buildup of debt and other macroeconomic uh, stresses uh, have taken Sri Lanka and Pakistan out of that high growth trajectory for the moment. But I, you know, as an economist, I take the long view, right? So, you know, when people talk to me about Sri Lanka, I said, yes, it's two to three years, four years, maybe longer if uh, they don't get their macroeconomic fundamentals right. But we also shouldn't forget that 70 years of development investments on literacy, on women's empowerment, uh, all the physical institutions, infrastructure that have been built, that's not going to go away because your debt to GDP ratio is suddenly uh, high, right? Mm -hmm. And so this governance uh, aspects, et cetera, I, know, I hope it can be worked, worked through. The larger, uh, you know, the trajectory, we are all low income, low to lower middle income countries. Mm -hmm. And you are supposed to grow faster when you are, uh, you know, it will be a miracle if the U.S. pulls off a 4% growth rate, right? But for developing countries, you know, 7% should be the norm, actually. Many countries that have made dramatic progress in East Asia, China even, Vietnam and India recently, Bangladesh, uh, you've shown uh, in recent years, uh, you know, seven is sort of the, the normal uh, rate for a country that is catching up. Mm -hmm. So I would like to believe that, uh, you know, once we uh, solve uh, some of these um, immediate problems on the macroeconomic front, uh, we can uh, learn some lessons on, on prudent macroeconomic management, uh, economic strategizing. From who? And uh, ourselves, from each other, <laughs> each other, you know. And uh, like India, mm -hmm. you know, used to, it ran into a big trouble in 91. That's what um, triggered the whole reform uh, process. But now it's sort of a brighter spot, you know, a big economy, but a brighter spot relative to all the problems that its neighbors are facing. Uh, Nepal is not quite uh, as vulnerable as the other countries, mm -hmm. partly because we're starting from such a low base, right? Mm -hmm. So we haven't, we haven't climbed uh, much to fall mm -hmm. uh, hard. So, and Bangladesh, I think, recently took some preemptive actions on, on the depletion of foreign exchange and all that. But Sri Lanka and Pakistan... It was long overdue. Sri Lanka and Pakistan definitely uh, are in trouble. Uh, Bangladesh is cautiously uh, moving ahead. Uh, uh, Nepal and Bhutan is also highly indebted mm -hmm. uh, and uh, all that. But... It is unique, as we all know, given its uh, special relationship with India. I think there are lessons to be learned from each other. Okay, yeah. so you don't think that LDC graduation is going to be posing any problem for Bangladesh, Nepal, or Bhutan? It's a You're different, that optimistic? Uh, it's a different case-by-case -case, uh, scenario, in my opinion. I have looked at the numbers uh, for all these countries uh, in the Asia-Pacific in my previous role as the chief economic advisor. Uh, Bangladesh is a big case, right? 100, 170 million people what is it, $450 billion economy, uh, given the dominance of your uh, RMG sector. Which uh, is also a problem. Uh, which is, yeah. You, over dependence. You over on dependence. Sector, and, yeah. you know, so economic diversification mm -hmm. has to uh, come in sooner than mm -hmm. later. And the benefit it's receiving, especially from the European Union on, mm -hmm. with the EBA, everything but arms, that definitely um, will uh, have an impact. And I know for a smaller economies, if you're not that dependent, there might have been a smoother transition towards GSP plus and others. Uh, but with Bangladesh, I realize there are some complications given the export volume as well as some of the co conventions that uh, Bangladesh is yet to sign. Um, and there is this uh, 
threat of other rivals, right? Cambodia and Vietnam possibly snatching away business if they negotiate a separate sort of preferential agreement with the European Union. With Nepal, that's not the case. With Nepal, we export very little to the European Union. In fact, just the other day, I was looking at our uh, the most recent numbers to the European Union is $75 million per year. That's three days of remittance inflows. <laughs> and what's the worst that's going to happen? Well, maybe 8 to 10% of tariffs slapped mm -hmm. on that existing sort of uh, volume. So it's, it's very little, right? And I've been arguing in the case of Nepal that we're already disadvantaged. We're not like Bangladesh. We're not mm -hmm. like Vietnam. We're not mm -hmm. even like India, uh, given our landlocked status. All the cost of trading, doing business, everything mm -hmm. is more expensive. Mm -hmm. So we can... We can't go much, uh, f uh, you know, we can't go farther by focusing on the cost competitiveness, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. It has to be premium, you know, the mm -hmm. organic, the Himalayan mm -hmm. brand, mm -hmm. whatever we do has to be premium product, low, high value to low products and all that, uh, high value to weight products and all that. So it's, we're, I think, distinct cases. Bangladesh, uh, it's, it's a more se serious uh, case, but remember, it's still four years away almost. Uh, and then there are some transition periods built in, with the, especially with the EBA. There's a further three-year period. Yes, so if countries be. cannot, you know, sort of uh, carve out a uh, sort of an outlet or a strat diversification strategy in nine to ten years, uh, I think uh, we may even also have to look inwards on our own, rather than relying on these external concessions. Uh, but it is a sensitive topic, I do, I do agree. And I think the whole society has to be carried along, and there has to be open dialogue on the pros and the cons. But you know, if you go back to the history, 71, we've crossed to 2021, so it's been 50 years of uh, this, uh, you know, permanent membership uh, uh, of the club of the poor. And, uh, and it's, uh, I think, uh, psychologically uplifting, sort of validating of development strategies, et cetera, uh, to really um, come out. But it cannot be a vanity project on the part of the leaders, right? It has to be grounded on, reali uh, on reality. And you have to take the carry the society along. And that's something that we are focused on in Nepal. And I think uh, you are doing this in Bangladesh too. I don't know. Talking about sensitivities, and, and I believe that I've heard you speak about vanity infrastructure, vanity projects in, in one of the World Bank meetings also. So do you think that governance is becoming a vanity in South Asia? Governance versus growth or governance and growth? You, you're free to comment on any of them. <laughs> No, it was, you know, for decades, we thought we can suffer bad governance if it delivers growth, right? For, you know, this is in the 60s and the 70s. This is why many of the dictators were even tolerated. But we've now, you know, thanks to Amartya Sen and other, other mm -hmm. folks, development thinkers, philosophers, that, you know, what is development? You know, it's not just shiny roads and skyscrapers. It's people, investment in people, the freedoms that they enjoy, the agency that they can ex exercise, the empowerment and all that. So... Even if you have to knock off, uh, you know, one or two percentage points of your annual growth rate, you better focus on good governance. You better don't. Uh, you better re, uh, sort of take care of the environment. You know, the challenge of sustainability. So these things, development has to be viewed holistically, and that's that should be. I mean, it's not a science in the sense that you can perfect the thing. It's it's, it's still an art. Um, but um, physical development progress, married with social advancements freedom to speak, uh, freedom to elect people uh, freely and fairly, all those issues, I think, uh, are part of development. So, you know, the holistic understanding of, and this is actually enshrined in the SDGs. You know, it's not a controversial statement. SDGs that almost all countries of the world have signed on to, you know, goal 16 on inclusive institutions, et cetera, reducing inequality in goal 10. So the old bread and butter traditional issues are there, but also some of these new aspirational uh, goals are also enshrined as are common common ambitions going leading up to 2030. So I, I do believe that, uh, you know, if you have good governance, growth will follow also, uh, you know, within, in the form of investments, uh, the um, confidence of the private sector that's, that comes in. And we've seen this in other countries. Uh, we've seen this in countries where, uh, you know, they might have started with bad governance, you mm -hmm. know, really dictatorial, uh, really undemocratic uh, thing. But as the size of the middle class enlarges, um, countries have transitioned. Some East Asian countries, you know, to name one, Korea, you know, started uh, very negatively, mm -hmm. and lo look at uh, where it is now. You know, with even presidents after they leave office, uh, held uh, accountable uh, quite quite harshly. So, if I understand well from you, so you need good politics for a good economy. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. So then, one probing question to you: 
Yes. How interested are you in politics? And, <laughs> and I was just reading up on you a few hours ago, and I saw that you have announced in Nepal 25 lakh rupees for journalists to expose corruption. I mean, why have you done that? And <laughs> is it that bad in Nepal? And I should am, we follow your I footsteps? Am, I am worried, Rubana, of things, uh, you know, uh, the governance standards that I believe uh, are deteriorating in, in Nepal. And the main problem in our country has been uh, uh, this tiny elite, uh, you know, all political parties, there are three or four major parties, and all leaders, they agree on one thing, right, to capture the institutions, to appoint yes men, uh, rarely women, mm -hmm. uh, into uh, positions of power. Mm -hmm. And what this is doing is really undermining uh, our liberal democracy. You know, what are the fundamental tenets of liberal democracy? Separation of powers. Well, the court is often, you know, uh, is already under the influence of the executive in our country. Uh, rule of law. You know, many people think they're above the law. And the fundamental freedom. Sometimes, you know, there's, there's a lot of uh, encroachment uh, in that space. So uh, we have been concerned, and, and recently some cases of corruption uh, are too big uh, to ignore. And uh, this is, uh, you know, taxpayers' money, but it's also scarce development, concessional finance that has come in. So, uh, and when formal institutions don't work, you know, the anti-corruption body is there, but it's captured. It's uh, appointed with all the political party cronies. In those circumstances, it's the job of informal networks, informal institutions, informal initiatives to come up. So indeed, uh, I have uh, set up an endowment, uh, a fairly sizable endowment that will fund in perpetuity an annual prize of almost 25 lakh Nepali rupees, which is similar to, I think, our exchange rates are similar, uh, Bangladeshi Taka and uh, Nepali rupees. Um, this, I hope, will encourage journalists to really probe really uh, go deep and, and unearth scandals that can hopefully topple bad govern governments and uh, hopefully lock up uh, bad politicians. You know, that's the, that's the goal. And I've been very vocal and candid about, uh, about this. And fortunately, there's a big support among the civil society, even among the press, and among the young people uh, in Nepal to, to carry this uh, forward. And... Uh, if we can terrify just half the politicians, <laughs> uh, I think uh, our mission would have been uh, achieved. But this is very much inspired by a well-known uh, prize, the Pulitzer Prize for Investigative Journalism. That has been around in the United States in 1917. You know, it's more than 100 years. You know, so th you know, we should learn from each other on these things. It doesn't matter if it's rich country, poor country. Uh, so let's see how, how it goes. But we've set it up. Uh, some very well-regarded uh, Nepali uh, personalities are, are behind this, and, and, and I really hope this will be one of our contributions uh, to cleaning up the system, but it cannot substitute for the formal process the, you know, from, from, from inside, right? I mean, this is something on the outside that will inform, that will inspire, that will nudge action, but it is not a substitute for, uh, for a cleaner polity that has to come from within. Uh, okay, on that... Uh Promising, optimistic, and super aggressive, but you know, <laughs> positively aggressive high note. We'd like to thank you, Swarnim, for having joined us today for your precious time. We hope that you come back to Bangladesh uh, over and over again. But let me also end with a quote of yours. So Dr. Swarnim Wagle, and uh, he said something very pertinent to the current landscape of South Asia. He said, Social progress can be pursued even in the absence of high GDP. That is the story of Nepal. Well, that should be the story of South Asia as well. Thank you for watching South Asian. We know we haven't been regular, but we hope to be super regular from next month onward. Please keep on watching South Asian. Thank you. <laughs>